Hello and welcome to this lecture video on the principle of treating people fairly and justly. In this first of two lectures on fairness and justice, we'll talk about the concept of fairness, the concept of justice, the relation between the two, and how it is that we can understand the principle operating for professionals and public servants. The general idea behind treating people fairly can be understood in two ways with two separate components that should ideally work together. The first is to understand treating people fairly as not discriminating between them on the basis of irrelevant grounds. And the second way of understanding what it means to treat people fairly is to give them the appropriate attention. That is to attend to the particular needs, interests, and abilities of the individual. Philosophically Fairness and justice have been treated together um, for quite some time. Most recently, uh, in the 1970s, John Rawls developed the concept of justice as fairness, where he, he articulated the conception of justice as really being uh, a question of fairness. So in determining what's right or good or how we should treat people w within the context of justice, what we really have to do is treat people fairly. Another way that we can understand um, justice and fairness being connected in philosophical discourse is through the concept of justice as desert. And many philosophers have talked about this all the way back to Plato in ancient Greece, talked about justice um, as a desert. That is, to treat someone as they deserve is to treat them justly. And that concept has um, a long and rich history in philosophy. Now, in the context of professionals and public servants, the way we need to understand these two general ideas playing out is, on the one hand, that treating people justly and fairly entails seeking some just and fair compensation for individuals who have been disadvantaged, either disadvantaged individually or disadvantaged as a member of a group. Another way in which this arises for professionals and public servants is that seeking to treat people fairly is to seek the just and fair consideration of what individuals deserve and what their needs, what their interests, and what their entitlements are. What's at issue when we're talking about justice and fairness is the distribution of benefits and burdens that result from life in a complex modern society. So really what's at stake here is trying to devise some just and fair distribution or allocation of the various benefits and of the various burdens that are the product of life in a complex modern society. Now, burdens include access and opportunity to the socially available resources and goods. Among these resources and goods can include education, health care, income or work, leisure, travel, and by travel I don't just mean leisure travel on vacation, but travel just getting from point A to point B. Is it something that requires the ownership of a vehicle? Can one walk? Is there public transit? Etc. The means of self-respect, that is the various ways in which people can generate for themselves um, self-respect. Liberty is included as a benefit, more or less liberty and the means of self-expression, creativity, articulation, speech, etc. These are all benefits that are the result of uh, a complex modern society. Now depending on how we organize our society, the distribution of these benefits can be shifted um, towards some and away from others, or away from some and toward others. Now, justice and fairness also has to do with the burdens that are the result of complex modern social life. And burdens can be generally understood as the provision of socially available resources and goods. That is, who it is who is tasked to provide those resources and goods. Whose duty is it to make those available? Whose job is it to make those benefits available? to the society or to individuals within that society. Burdens can also be understood as the denial of access or opportunity. 
and lastly burdens can be understood as a kind of punishment. So included among the various burdens that uh, result from complex modern society are poverty, social and economic immobility. If some rise and some don't, then some are not mobile as others are. Economic and social instability as the workplace changes and shifts, jobs are created, jobs are lost. Low status but necessary work, these are among the burdens. For example, um, someone's got to sweep the streets, someone's got to clean the public toilets, someone's got to take away the garbage, someone's got to sort through all of the recyclables, someone's got to clean the beds, wash the sheets, someone's got to take care of the sick, someone has to care for children when their parents are away. These are all low status but necessary work. And so having uh, only opportunities to work in low status but necessary jobs uh, can affect people's sense of self and their feeling that what they've got is a burden rather than a benefit. Also among the burdens of life in a complex modern society might include the, the deprivation of liberty. This is often the, the preferred form of punishment in democratic societies, that if someone is deserving of punishment that usually takes the form of denying them liberty, and that's often referred to as jail or prison or a sentence of some sort. A burden can also include the denial of the means of self-respect and self-expression and unsociable shift work. If we have a society in which the expectation is that people will have access to services and resources 24-7, then someone's got to, sh to staff those positions, fill those jobs, um, play those roles in hours that are unsociable overnight, early morning, on the weekends, um, or when they could otherwise spend that time with their children or their families, or doing something self-creative, um, and so forth. So unsociable shift work would also be included in and among the burdens of life in a complex modern society. Now both benefits and burdens are necessary features of complex social life. It would be difficult to imagine a society in which there were only benefits and no burdens um, and vice versa, that there were only burdens and no benefits. So both are fundamental elements to life in a complex society. And both are distributable through social policies, laws, institutional practices, and this is what I refer to um, in the way in which we organize our society. We could organize our society, that is, have different policies, laws, and institutional practices, and organizing our society differently would shift the distribution of benefits and burdens away from some toward others, or distribute them more broadly, more generally, and so forth. Um, also, benefits and burdens are distributable through individual professional and public servants' actions. Now, as you um, are a professional or as you are a public servant in the course of your everyday work, in your everyday roles as professionals and public servants, you will be distributing some of these benefits and some of these burdens. As you accept clients and work with them, as you care for clients um, or patients, you make available resources, but that uh, availability comes at a cost to you. It might require you to work weekends or work nights. It might require you to put in extended hours and so forth. So all of the decisions that you make as a professional and as a public servant um, affect the distribution of burdens and benefits for yourself and for others in society. And among those others in society we should include also your colleagues, your co-professionals, the people you work with, as well as the people you serve. Now, with regard to the ethics of the matter, as opposed to the laws of the matter, and we're not really going to go into um, the legal elements that pertain to the distribution of burdens and benefits, though there are some, uh, we're going to talk about the ethics of how we choose um, to engage with others such that we affect the distribution of burdens and benefits. Ethically, 
these decisions, the distribution of burdens and benefits, should not be based on irrelevant criteria. So how do we distinguish relevant criteria from irrelevant criteria? Well, let's take a look at fairness and equality, because these are the two real issues at stake here. Equality is the primary value that is at play when we're talking about treating people fairly and justly. So this principle to treat people fairly and justly requires, on the one hand, that people who are alike in morally relevant respects ought to be treated alike. But it also allows, on the other hand, that people who are different in morally relevant respects can be treated differently in proportion to the difference between them. So the direction that we get from this principle um, that requires us to treat people fairly and justly is that um, those who are alike in morally relevant respects should be treated alike and those who are different in morally relevant respects should be treated differently in proportion to the difference between them. So what does this mean? Well, in the absence of a morally relevant difference, the default setting is that individuals should be treated alike. They should be treated equally. Unequal treatment then requires some ethical justification. If the default setting, if the starting point according to the principle to treat people fairly and justly is that individuals be treated equally, then any deviation from equal treatment requires ethical justification. And this is where relevant differences play a significant role. It is the relevance of the difference that justifies unequal treatment between individuals. This requires, however, that we treat people consistently. So if we recognize a relevant difference, then anyone who has that same relevant difference we should treat consistently. That is, anyone who's different in the same way should be treated differently in the same way. That difference in treatment should be proportional. That is, the ethical justification for different treatment requires that the treatment be proportional to the relevant difference. Especially if what we're talking about is a compensatory treatment or a um, a requirement to treat people in such a way that their disadvantages are remediated or compensated for. So the difference in treatment must be proportional to the disadvantage that they suffered. Now fairness and justice um, have a slightly different meaning. That is, there's a slightly different way that we should think about things uh, from the point of view of fairness and the point of view of justice. Fairness is generally understood as a comparative concept. It emphasizes the requirement to ascertain whether people are being treated appropriately in comparison with others. Similarly situated individuals receive similar treatment. Differently situated individuals receive different treatment. So here with fairness, what we're looking at is a comparison between the individual for whom we are trying to determine what the right treatment is, what the right course of action is, how they ought to be um, addressed, in comparison to others. Well, if we've encountered others like this person, if we've had other similar clients, then we treat this client similarly, that is, we compare how they are um, like or unlike our previous clients or other clients and we treat them like or unlike as a result of a comparative assessment between the individual and others. And then any difference in treatment would have to be relevant to a difference between the individuals in the comparison group uh, and with the client. Justice, on the other hand, is generally understood in a non-comparative fashion. Justice is generally understood as fittingness. That is, in an assessment of the individual on her or his own terms. So what we do when we're concerned with justice is we examine and consider the individual's needs, interests, capacity, their contribution, 
their um, history, their uh, membership in a group or not that has been um, at a social or economic disadvantage in order to determine what treatment is appropriate, what is most fitting for this person. What we're doing from the perspective of justice is examining what this individual needs as the individual that they are, not in comparison to other individuals. So for example, fairness and justice can be related to each other depending on what kind of procedure we might have to allocate scarce resources. For example, um, students might be uh, all interested in taking a core course in a program, but there just aren't enough seats available to accommodate everyone who wants to take the course. So we can allocate the seats available to the students who want to take the course by flipping a coin or by a random lottery. And so in that respect, we would be treating everyone who wants access to that course fairly. Everyone has a flip of the coin, everybody puts their name in the random lottery, and the outcome is a fair outcome because everyone was treated alike. However, the outcome might not be understood as just, and it might actually not be just, because justice requires us to look at the needs and interests and capacities and contribution of the individuals at stake. So access to that course, um, when it's determined on the basis of justice, might require us to allocate seats according to um, the degree to which uh, the course would serve the student's adequate progress through the program, the degree to which the student would be likely to succeed in the course, their preparation for it, um, their ability to demonstrate their skill and talent through the course, whether the course would be a prerequisite for a subsequent course or perhaps be beneficial to them in the pursuit of a particular career or job and so forth. So the allocation of seats to students from the perspective of justice might seem unfair but would achieve a distribution that could be said to be just because it's attentive to the circumstances of each individual who is granted access to the course. Now ideally what we have is justice and fairness working together. That is that um, that a just outcome would also be a fair outcome and that a fair outcome would also be a just outcome. And so what this requires of us is to be attentive to the ways in which people can be differently situated, uh, which would require differential treatment, but to do so consistently without the imposition of any other injustices. So let's take a look at what relevant differences are. First we have to distinguish between relevant differences, accounting for relevant differences, and stereotyping. Because stereotyping is to generalize uh, about an individual, to uh, make assumptions about an individual based on generalized criteria or categories. And we know in the past, um, and still today, that some of the distribution of burdens and benefits um, of social life have been made on the basis of class, that is socioeconomic status, on the basis of sex or race or ethnicity or tribal membership, historically also kinship, age, birth order. We have a long history of preferencing birth order, um, not always to the benefit of the individuals involved in society of culture, of religious affiliation, of nationality, all of these are ways in which uh, in the past we have allocated burdens and benefits of social life. But what we do is that we is that we notice well maybe this is missing the important elements. Uh, maybe it's not so much an individual sex or race but some particular feature attribute that we are assuming is attached to sex or that is attached to race such that we can generalize to people of that sex or to people of that race. Now generalization applies only in the aggregate if at all and may have very little relation to the individual and when that's the case that is when we generalize about um, features of kinds of individuals and we generalize to a particular individual then what we're doing is we're stereotyping. Now stereotyping can happen in two ways and it's important to distinguish between the two. 
we can stereotype people. And by stereotyping people, what we're doing is we're assuming that all members of some group have some particular attribute. For example, women, we might believe, are more caring than men. So if there is a profession um, that involves a significant commitment to caring and significant skill at caring, for example, nursing, we might make the mistake of assuming that nursing should be a profession only available to women. And what we're doing then is we're stereotyping people. So we're distributing burdens and benefits to individuals according to uh, what we believe that individual is capable of by their association with some group or other. Stereotyping the situation is another way we can stereotype. And when we stereotype situations, what we're doing is we're assuming that all situations of a certain kind are only appropriate for members of a certain group. So what we're doing is we're not um, stereotyping the group so much as we're stereotyping the situation. So for example, crowd control in a situation of crowd control, protests, marches, demonstrations, um, that sort of situation uh, is a situation only appropriate for men. And when we look at what's going on there, we would say something to the effect of crowd control requires strength, and assuming only men are strong, then we would make a decision that only police officers who are men should be assigned to the duty of crowd control. And so what we're doing is we're stereotyping the situation. Now since historically we have assumed that generalized differences such as sex, religion, or age were the relevant differences, it's easy for our practices and our professions to have lingering dimensions of this historic um, generalizing, this historic form of stereotyping. But what we have to be attentive to for our practices and our decisions, of course, to be ethical is that we have to be attentive to what exactly is the quality that we're after. What quality is it that makes someone good at doing some particular task? What is the quality that makes someone good at nursing or that makes someone good at uh, accounting or that makes someone good at firefighting or that makes someone good at uh, policing? So we want to find the qualities that make someone good at doing that task. That is, that will allow them to be successful in the role that is so important to society that people fill and that people feel effectively and successfully. So what we're thinking about is thinking about not focusing on the fact that someone is a woman, but focusing on the fact that someone is capable of caring in a sufficient degree and that is the relevant attribute for nursing. So whether someone is a man or a woman is irrelevant, but what's relevant is their capacity to care. And so we would remove any restrictions on access to the profession of nursing that were based on sex, and instead make access based on an individual's capacity to care. That would be a more just distribution of the opportunity to engage in a profession such as nursing. So again, for example, it's not being a man but having strength that is the relevant attribute for crowd control. And when we recognize the relevant attribute is strength, not sex, then we should change our policies such that um, the duty of crowd control being assigned crowd control duty for the police force is not distributed according to whether or not someone is a man or a woman but according to whether or not someone is physically strong enough, is someone has the physical strength to um, contribute to the function of crowd control in the necessary ways. And we understand also empirically that the distribution of strength is not clearly distinct and discrete between the sexes, but many men are um, uh, stronger than women, but also many women are stronger than many men. And so when strength is the criterion that we're after, then our policies should allow for the distribution of the, the burdens and benefits of policing according to um, that criterion, not according to something else like sex. For example, also, it's not um, being a single mother that uh, is relevant to accessing community provided health care, but 
poverty, being poor, is the relevant attribute for access to community health care. And so once we're clear about what the criterion is by which um, access to community-based health care should be provided, that is, that it should be provided for the poor um, to ensure everyone has access to some health care, then a person's being a single mother or not is not the relevant determining factor, but their poverty. And so as some single women are poor uh, and some single women are not, then access to that community-based health care would be based on the poverty of the individual, not whether or not they're a single mother or a mother at all. Also, for example, um, it's not a matter of someone's being Latina um, in order to uh, participate or serve in a legal aid clinic uh, that serves um, a, an immigrant or a Latino uh, Latina community, but their fluency in Mexican culture and language, which is the relevant criterion, the relevant attribute. And so we would want to make sure that our hiring policies and our staffing policies were such that the relevant criterion is uh, the deciding factor. And also, for example, not being young, but being creative is the relevant attribute for a particular job, then we would want to make sure that in our job description and in our hiring policies, we didn't um, discriminate against individuals for their having or lacking youth, but for their ability to, ability to demonstrate their creativity, since that's the relevant criterion. So now let's take a look at ethically relevant differences. And when we're looking at ethic and trying to decide which are ethically relevant differences, what we want to do is ask, what is the attribute most relevant to the proposed distribution of benefits and burdens to the proposed access or opportunity or to the proposed um, scheduling or denial of opportunity. So if strength is the most relevant attribute to the task, then using gender is unfair as gender um, in the aggregate only matches up with strength. Some women are stronger than some men. And if creativity is most relevant to the task, then using age would be unfair um, in allocating the role or the job, since youth only in the aggregate matches up with creativity. Some older people are still far more creative than some younger ones, and so access to um, that benefit or that burden should be determined by the relevant criterion. So the difference between individuals shouldn't be their sex, but their strength. The difference between individuals shouldn't be their age, but their creativity. Now remember from Learning Module 3 where we looked at ethical relevance and when we're trying to figure out the ethical relevance of something, um, uh, some feature attribute is ethically relevant when including that factor, including that feature would change our assessment of what is the right action. So for example, if the age of a child makes a difference in, the, in an assessment about whether they should have access to contra contraception, then age is an ethically relevant factor. But we have to look a little more deeply. That's what this is asking us to do. Our concern with treating people fairly and justly is asking us to dig a little more deeply. Is age really the relevant criterion? Or is it some age-related capacities necessary to the action, necessary to access to contraception? For example, the ability to reason well about one's near and long-term health and material interests and about the consequences of one's actions and the ability to live with them. If these are the capacities that we are attaching to age when we say that age is the relevant factor, then what we have to really be attentive to is not so much the age of the individual, but their possessing or not possessing these capabilities. So fairness would um, ask us to see how this treatment of this individual compares with treatment of other individuals of this particular age. And justice would require us to examine or ask what is fitting for this individual given her age. So there are two ways that we can examine the case. But what we want to be attentive to is not just to focus in on age, not just to focus in on the apparent criterion, but to look at the actual criterion that is relevant to the task or relevant to the choice or relevant to the activity. Ideally, fair treatment and just treatment align. 
So why are we thinking about treating people differently? Well, so far I've referenced, and I haven't really examined, this idea of disadvantages. So when we're treating people differently on the basis of relevant differences, then what we're doing is, in a sense, compensating for the degree of difference that that individual has to the comparison group. Some differences are relevant when they've been used as the basis for past discriminatory distributions of burdens and benefits. So in the past, when our policies were sex discriminatory, or age discriminatory, or um, discriminatory on the basis of religious affiliation, or on the basis of race, so you were, um, if our policies in the past allowed jobs to be distributed differently, because of different races, then that would be a past discriminatory distribution of jobs which were distributed not on the basis of the capacity of the individual to fill those jobs, to play those roles, but on the basis of the individual's race. Then we can think about treating people fairly and justly as requiring some compensatory action some redistribution or what's often referred to as positive discrimination or affirmative action. These two words can be used interchangeably. Now positive discrimination or affirmative action have two variants. There's a strong variation and there's a weak variation. The strong variation requires that we give a higher priority to members of a disadvantaged group even when they might be otherwise less qualified to fill the role or to access the service. The weak variation of positive discrimination, the weak variation of affirmative action, requires us to give a higher priority to members of disadvantaged groups only when they are otherwise equally qualified. So if we have two candidates for a position, one man, one woman, and in the past access to these jobs or access to these promotions has been discriminatory such that women have been denied access or promotion because they are women not because they were lacking capability then on the strong variation of positive discrimination women should be prioritized into the position or into the promoted position even where they might be less qualified than some of the men who might also be eligible for promotion or eligible for the position. The weak variation of positive discrimination would require us to give a higher priority to women applicants or women um, who are uh, eligible for promotion only when they are otherwise equally qualified to any um, of the male applicants or um, male contenders for promotion. On the weak variation we've got two equally qualified individuals one man one woman because in the past discrimination has run against women we give a higher priority to the women candidates. The strong variation we have unequally qualified individuals, unequally qualified applicants, but we give a higher priority to the applicant who is from the group that has historically been discriminated against and allow them to have the promotion or to be hired. These are two very different forms of treatment. And it's important to note here um, that this is the point at which um, professionals and public servants would have to be attentive to what is legally required or legally prohibited in determining how to um, apply affirmative action or positive discrimination. It may be the case that the law prohibits the strong variation and permits the weak variation. It may be that the law um, permits the strong variation as well as the weak variation. Or it may be the case that uh, there are different contexts, different situations, um, which map onto um, the different historical uh, historical patterns of discrimination. But ethically, it's important to remember these 
these two different ways to talk about affirmative action, these two different variations of positive discrimination. So when we're talking about positive discrimination, we're talking about working out how we treat individuals who are members of historically disadvantaged groups, on the one hand. But also, um, we could also be thinking about individuals who have been disadvantaged individually. It may be the case that individuals um, are disadvantaged uh, as individuals, not as members of historically disadvantaged groups. And so it's sometimes very difficult to distinguish these two because in many countries, including in this country, the two often run together. So some individuals experience discrimination on the basis of their membership in, in a particularly disadvantaged group, but also um, on the basis of, of uh, individual attributes that um, aren't uh, associated with the individual group or with the historically disadvantaged group. So we have to be attentive to the ways in which disadvantage extends across generations. The poverty of the parents affects the um, opportunity uh, and access that their children have to quality education or to quality health care. So we shouldn't be surprised to find in the children of people of parents who are poor that they have um, health needs that are the result of and map onto poverty. Um, and how their parents came to be in poverty may be the effect of historical discrimination. So for example, uh, racial minorities or religious minorities um, or ethnic minorities uh, in this country um, may be uh, denied opportunities to study, to enter professions, to um, work in certain places, to live in certain places, and so the effects of that on the generation of the parents or the grandparents carries over onto the children and the grandchildren. And so we see the effects of those discriminations, even though it, it's the case that the children um, today might not be suffering the same discrimination, but the legacy of that uh, as it carries over in their access to education, in their access to health care and so forth, uh, in their ability to take advantage of opportunities that are otherwise present. What kinds of disadvantage are we talking about? Well, we're talking about, on the one hand, disadvantages that are the result of social and institutional policies and structures. For example, poverty, racism, sexism. They can also be disadvantages that are the result of other forces that impinge on the individual. For example, illness or accident or the necessity for child care, the availability or unavailability of child care that someone has extended family who would be willing to take care of the child while the parent finds work. All of these are factors that um, result in some of us having uh, disadvantages relative to others and also disability. And again, these are not easily distinguishable. Disability, for example, is partly the result of the way in which we've designed our physical workspaces, our cities, and our building codes. Illness is also partly the result of inequalities in access to preventive and curative health care. So someone might, be, uh, might suffer from frequent chronic illness uh, as a result of growing up in um, a toxic neighborhood, a neighborhood that was polluted, whose parents were unable to move to a healthier environment or unable to provide the kind of health care that would have ensured that individual grew up healthy. So it's not easy to distinguish whether something is the result of a social or institutional policy, the way in which we've organized our society, or the way in which um, an individual has experienced that uh, society or the, at the attributes or affects of the individual themselves. All right, what are some of the challenges for compensating for disadvantage? Well, we have to be careful um, to ask two main questions. When we're trying to determine a course of action that looks like it might require differential treatment, we have to ask ourselves, should any differential treatment, any compensatory treatment, be based on group or on individual disadvantages? That is based on socially caused disadvantages that affect a group 
to whom this individual belongs, or compensation, compensatory action based on um, disadvantages particular to the individual. The second question we need to ask, is it fair and just to compensate individuals only for socially caused disadvantages, or are there other disadvantages that might also be relevant? Now we're going to explore this in considerable detail in the next lecture. So for now, let's just bear in mind that these are the two main questions to ask. Should compensation be based on group or individual disadvantages? And is it fair and just to compensate individuals only for socially caused disadvantages? Might there be other disadvantages that are relevant in deciding how it is that I ought to um, treat this individual? Where there are legally permissible ways to compensate for socially caused disadvantages, then it is only ethically permissible it is only ethically permissible to compensate for those disadvantages if there is sufficient evidence to indicate the benefit of doing so will outweigh any injustice or harm caused by doing so. Now this is an interesting point at which the principle to treat people justly and fairly intersects with the principle to seek the best results. So it is only ethically permissible to treat people compensatorily, that is to treat people differentially, if there is sufficient evidence to indicate that the benefit of doing so will outweigh any injustices that might be caused or any harms that might be caused by treating people differentially. And we also have to bear in mind that there are strong ethical reasons of fairness and justice to support compensating for disadvantages more broadly than just those that are socially caused. And always, 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 professionals must seek to avoid actions which unintentionally create injustice for others. And it's at this point that again the principles are starting to intersect. If we um, conduct ourselves with regard to one client such that we're creating an injustice for another, then that course of action was not the course of action that brings about the best results. It might have been the course of action that was fair and just to that individual client, but its effect is to create an injustice or a disadvantage for someone else. And so that would not be the course of action that would bring about the best results. What we would want to do as professionals and public servants is to find that course of action that allows us to treat our client or to treat individuals differentially, that is, fairly and justly, but that does not create injustice or disadvantage for others. And that would then satisfy also the principle that requires us to seek the best results. All right, wrapping up this rather long lecture, and I apologize for that. Treating people fairly and justly requires treating them equally unless and in proportion to a relevant difference between them. Relevant differences must be assessed according to the necessary quality or criterion by which the distributions of burdens and benefits is determined. That is by the criterion which is most relevant to the actual performing of the job or to the actual access or opportunity um, that is available. This may require compensatory action when past systematic disadvantages now affect the current distribution of benefits and burdens. The implications for professionals are several. First implication is that professionals and public servants are required to treat the interests of all people as equally important and to bear in mind that it is normally unfair to treat people differently on the basis of general differences such as sex, race, age, religion, and so forth. We must avoid stereotyping individuals and situations. And we have to identify as precisely as possible the relevant differences between individuals when we are trying to discern whether or not differential treatment is required. We are to avoid actions or courses of action or conduct which unintentionally disadvantage people. This would be a violation of the principle which requires us to seek the best results. And we have to consider the appropriateness of compensatory action. That is, we have to first determine whether or not it is legally permissible. And then if it is legally permissible, now we are in the domain of determining what is the ethically required course of action. What is the most ethical course of action? 
Okay, here are some questions to think about. They ask you to think about different elements of the lecture, think about some examples, create some examples of your own, and if you can work your way through these questions, then you should be good to head on to the next lecture. Thank you very much.